Joshua Seftel is known for directing the Emmy-winning breakthrough series Queer Eye for the Straight Guy and the feature film War, Inc., starring John Cusack, Marissa Tomei, and Ben Kingsley. Well, Joshua received his first Emmy nomination at the age of 22 with his documentary Lost and Found about Romania's orphan children. He then followed it with several documentaries, including the political campaign film Taking on the Kennedys, selected by Time Magazine as one of the 10 best of the year. And he continues to helm the ongoing documentary series he created, Secret Life of Muslims, a Peabody Award finalist and Emmy nominee. The timely personal short films which combat Islamophobia have more than 70 million views to date. In his newest documentary, a riveting true story, Stranger at the Gate, has been nominated for an Academy Award. And the film won a special jury prize at the 2022 Tribeca Film Festival and has been praised by top media outlets. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Academy Award nominated film director Joshua Seftel to the show. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here, Ward. Well, what does it feel like being uh, nominated for an Academy Award? That's exciting. You know, it's a first for me. Um, I've had a lot of Emmys and other awards, but this is a this is a new one, and it's a bit it's it means a lot. And what it means to me is just that we're going to be able to have our film reach more people, and that's that's what I care about. So it's very exciting. Well, you know, you have a very large body of work. Uh, does a film director ever think that they will be nominated or do they try to be nominated or is it just something that just happens in the midst of their career? You know, I think for me, I can really only speak for me. It's, it's, um, it's sort of a perfect storm. You know, it's, we I've made a lot of films. People have said a couple of them felt like, Oh, this could be, this could be one that could go, you know, make it to the Oscars. Hasn't happened until now. Um, there's something about this film that we just made stranger at the gate, which got nominated that I think has just has the right contours. It, it, it has checks the right boxes. Um, it's about something that is very relevant right now, which is, you know, hate and the, and the power of love in the face of hate. Uh, you know, we live in a time where we're so divided and I just believe that people are really hungry for a story that shows us a way that we can find a way to get along. And um, I think that this film kind of has that blueprint in it of like, hey, here's a way we could actually get along uh, in our society and maybe not be so divided. I can tell you more about that, but it's, I think that's what it's about. I think that's why people are drawn to the film. And I, and you, you bring something up that just popped into my mind because as I watched the film and there's a very important, there's many important elements in this film, Stranger at the Gate. And it really comes down to the fact that it is up to us to make the first step to meet somebody, to listen to the other side, and to remove all judgment until we listen to their story. Then we can make, well, you know, I'm not going to say an opinion, but we can actually understand their truth, you know, the, the term that everybody's using today, that we can understand that and come together. But this is a very powerful story. And for you, how did you come across the story about Richard McKinney? Sure. Well, you know, Richard McKinney is a, a guy who, he was a U.S. Marine. Uh, he served for 25 years overseas, came back to the U.S. very messed up, PTSD, kind of a lost soul and he decided that he was going to bomb the local mosque because he had such a deep hatred for muslims so he built a bomb and he went over to the mosque and he was living in muncie indiana and he went to the mosque there which is the islamic center of muncie and he scouted it out and when he he actually entered the building and he was greeted by the congregants there. In particular, he was greeted by a woman named Bibi Barami, who was a, a, the president of the mosque and founder of the mosque. And she's a lovely woman who is an inspiration, I think, for all of us. But she and her husband, Sabra Barami, and a man named Jomo Williams, they, they greeted Richard with kindness. And they could tell that he, they could tell he was a scary dude. I mean, he, he's a big, tough guy covered in tattoos, 
he was he looked angry he was red in the face he was pacing around the, the mosque like they knew this guy was like trouble you know but they they still showed him love and kindness and they hugged him and they welcomed him and they talked to him and they made him feel seen and heard and and you know he he came back the next day and the day after and he started hanging out at the mosque and and he and they gave him roles to play like they made him feel important and um you know they had him be their security guard at the front um and they didn't know they didn't know that he was planning to kill them they just were trying to help this guy out and over time he changed his mind and he ended up uh becoming a member of the mosque rather than becoming a a murderer a mass murderer and you know to me this is just a story that shows the power of love in the face of hate and you know it was just mlk day uh, a few days ago and you know i'm paraphrasing but martin luther king always said you know the only thing that can beat hate is love and this is the perfect example of that and uh you know i i find the story to be inspiring i personally was feeling depressed about our world until i met met bb barami and her husband saber you know they they give me hope. Well, was it difficult to get BB and Richard to agree to take part in the film? So we, well, we found, we found the story in a newspaper article in a small newspaper article, and we reached out to Richard. And at the time he was actually talking about this story because he had converted, he had changed the way he thought about Muslims. He was a new man and he was sharing his story with the hope of, changing the way people people think in our world. So he was very open to it. I think with B in the case of BB, you know, she didn't know who I was. I was some guy from New York, you know, calling her in Muncie and asking her to be in a film. But she understood that, you know, my background is that I faced a lot of anti-Semitism growing up in upstate New York. You know, kids called me Jew Kike, um, threw pennies at me to show me that Jews are are, you know, are supposedly cheap um and someone threw a, a rock the size of a brick through the front window of our home so growing up in in this town in upstate new york i i you know those those experiences stayed with me and years later after 9 11 when i saw my muslim friends facing hatred i felt a connection to them i i understood to on some level what they were going through and that's when i decided to start making films about american muslims and trying to tell stories about them that i thought were more accurate than those that were being told in the media so this film is part of a of an eight year long effort that i've been doing it's actually the 25th film that i made about this subject matter and uh and it's really exciting to be working in this space right now well, it's been over what it's been over twenty years since nine eleven, um, and I know that this film uh, it breaks the stereotype that so many Americans uh, think about Muslims. I think part of the blame could be the media in in that area. But for you, how hard has it been to get this message out, especially since nine eleven? Um, to change the idea or the stereotype of what uh, Americans think about Muslims. Yeah, it's it's been hard. Um, it was hard to get funding for this project. You know, it took a couple of years to get funding. Um, but you know, in 2015, when there was a lot of anti-Muslim rhetoric and there was talk of banning Muslims from our country, um, that is when I was able to get more support for this for this project and um it's always been an uphill battle to to get people to um you know watch these films i think we you know we've we've had a lot of success we've actually our our series has had more than 70 million views uh we've been nominated for an emmy and a peabody so we we've, we've been able to reach people i think this film in particular has the potential not just to reach people, but
but to reach people who maybe might not normally watch a film like this um, because I think they will, I think Richard McKinney, the Marine is a very good messenger. I think people will relate to him. I think people find him, they connect with him. I think they understand him. I think they know people like him. And uh, he's a great messenger for this this story. And that's what excites me is I know we're reaching into new audiences and new territories and not just preaching to the choir. For example, you know, in the past two weeks, I know Joe Rogan has spoken about the film extensively at least twice. Uh, and, you know, that's a big audience and it's the kind of audience you know, we want to reach. So we're, we're very excited about um, what we're accomplishing with this film. Well, the film is very, very powerful. And it's powerful to the point that do you believe that with the right people uh, getting the message out, having the right people see this film, that it could actually prevent future mass shootings? You know, I, it's hard to answer that question. It's, of course, it's the dream of a, any filmmaker that you could create that kind of change with your work. You know, the first film I made when I was 22 was about the abandoned children of Romania. I don't know if you remember that story in 1990, but that was, you know, there were over 120,000 abandoned children in Romania. And the film I made was on public television and it led to the American adoption of thousands of Romanian children. And, you know, that was my first, I was spoiled because that was my first film. And I was like, wow, this filmmaking thing is pretty easy. You can just create change so simply. Um, it's not really usually that simple. Uh, I do think this film has the potential to change hearts and minds. I well, do you, think. Well, you said, Joshua, that you had a hard time getting funding. Uh, what were some of the things that were told to you that they wouldn't give you funding for a film like this based on its content? I, we just got a lot of no's that was, you know, I have, I saved some of the letters, but it was just like, no, sorry, no, you know, but when, you know, around 2015, when things were heating up, some of those people, some of those foundations that said, no, they reached out to me <laughs> and said, Hey, are you still doing that project? Cause we, we need, we need to counter some of these ideas like that Muslims should be driven out of the country. And, um, and so that was, um, that was really a nice turn of events uh, for this project. Um, unfortunately, it, it, you know, it was the silver lining of a dark cloud. Uh, so, it, but I, I hope that, I do believe things are getting a bit better in some ways in this country since then. Well, what did Bibi and the rest of those, uh, the congregates at the mosque, uh, what went through their mind when they re re realized what Richard's original intention was going to be? Yes, that's a great question. So what happened was they heard rumors. They heard rumors. Hey, you know that guy that's been hanging around the mosque, the guy that you embraced? He was planning to kill us. He wanted to blow us up. He wanted to kill 200 people. And when they heard that, you know, Bibi Varami, her reaction, you're not going to believe this, but she said, okay, um, I know what to do. She said, I'm going to invite him over for dinner. And so she invited him over for dinner. She cooked him this big meal uh, of Afghan Afghan food. You know, she's she's an Afghan refugee, and um, and she cooked him a traditional meal. She brought all her friends and people who were concerned about him over to the for the dinner. And Richard ate lots of food, and he you know he had seconds. And um, and when he was done eating, she just said, "Richard, I need to ask you something. Is it true what I've heard?" that you were planning to kill us. And he just looked down, and he was ashamed. And he said, yes, that is true. I was planning to kill you. He said, but what you've taught me, what I've learned from you uh, has changed me. And if I had known someone like you sooner, I would never have thought that way. And it was this incredible moment where not only did he was he able to sort of confess and they were able to listen and hear, but they forgave him. They forgave him and they allowed him to stay in their community. And he went on to become president of the mosque. So it's, it's just a, it's just the kind of story you're not hearing today. Well, in the, we, we hear 
such it's, depressing things, but there are stories like this. And there is, but what I loved about this, um, like I said from the very beginning, it's a riveting documentary. It is the most powerful 23 minutes that anybody can sit uh, and watch because you keep thinking, what's going to happen? Where's this story going to go? Because it starts off, you know, you're already inside the mind of Richard McKinney immediately because of the way you set it up. But as it goes on, the major element that I took away from Stranger at the Gate was how love and kindness conquered hate. I mean, changing one's bias, uh, changing one's idea of racism. I mean, was this the main theme you wanted to bring forth in this film? I think it's, I think it's inherent to the story. I think it's at the heart of the story. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's what's beautiful about this story is that people are able to change that someone who is so filled with hatred that he, that he actually wants to murder innocent people could change his mind and become friends with those people is it's such a beautiful story and we're in a moment where we're so divided and it's hard to see how we could get along uh but when I look at this story and we look at this story and see like this guy transformed from being filled with hate to being filled with love for the same people. It's just, it, it says to me, anything's possible. You know, there was one, there's one quote in um, the press that just came out recently. And it's something like, if there's any film this year that has the potential to eradicate hate, uh, it's stranger at the gate. And I, when I saw that, I was like, oh man, that like, that's just so beautiful. I, I hope it's true. You know, I hope it's true. That's, uh, it would be a beautiful thing. Yeah. I'm, you know, last year um, was when, you know, we saw the campaigns or it could have been 2021, but definitely in 2022, seeing a campaign out there on a global scale to end racism. But as this campaign was moving along, it wasn't really ending anything. I kept seeing more and more racism rise up. Even from those who want to see racism end, even the words that came out of their mouth was stoking the fire of racism. Then, towards the latter part of last year, all of a sudden we see all of this hate come up and through the media uh, about Jews. And, and, I'm, and I'm like, what is going on here? I mean, where is this coming from? Because I didn't understand it. And you coming from, you know, you being raised, born and raised Jewish, you know, you've seen things that I will never understand, which I see why you uh, could relate to this incredible story of Richard McKinney and B.B. and all of those at the mosque. So you understand that emotion. You understand that hate that comes from people who are judging with, with a complete lack of understanding. I mean, are you looking at possibly doing films that will bring a more positive light through all of this crazy world, this diversity that we're seeing, this racism, but showing a, a brighter side for the Jewish people? That's a good question. People have asked me, like, you're Jewish. Why, why aren't you making films about Jews? You know, and, and my feeling is I'm a person. And I also feel like hate is hate. You know, it does, we're all, we're all, we all have this shared humanity. And why not make a film about another group? Why not stand up for other people? I, I think we're all people and we all have this, this shared common ground. And um, sure, maybe someday I'll make a film about Jews. Right now I made a film about Muslims, you know, and I feel a real strong connection to it. Um, and to the message, you know, one of the, um, when we showed the film at the mosque where we filmed it, you know, we, we went there, we filmed last summer, we edited it for months. And then when we were done, we 
we had a screening for that for the community you know because they were so generous uh to us and when we um we showed the film i really didn't know what they were going to think i didn't know if they were going to like it if they were going to hate it if they were going to like you know yell at me i i just didn't know you know and we we showed the film and about 80 people came and when the film was over they turned the lights on and one guy uh, a doctor actually stood up in the back of the room and he said, um, I just want to say one thing. Uh, we need to make sure that every American sees this film. And, you know, first I felt a sense of relief and then I felt a sense of obligation. You know, we, it's my job to make sure that as many people see this film as possible because I think there's a, a very positive message, a very educational message. And it's also, I think, a very, um, as you, you, I think you said, use the word riveting. Um, you know, it's, I think it's, it's a very uh, exciting film to watch. Um, and so it, it has a lot going for it, I think. And I hope, I really hope that as many people can, can see this film as possible, because I do think it has the, the potential to, to change the way people think. Yeah, I was talking to a couple of directors um, yesterday, by the way, and the thought came into my mind, and, and I think I probably should continue to talk this so that way the film industry will finally uh, have their light bulb go off. You know, back in the day, you, you would go see a movie and they would show 15 minutes worth of cartoons. Now they show 15, 20 minutes worth of advertisements and about 10 trailers before the film actually starts. Why not start putting in the short films before the actual feature. So movies like this or documentaries can be seen by a much wider audience and get the message out. If, if it's from a movie or a short film that's just creative work or it's a documentary like yours that has a very powerful message to bring change. I think it's time that the, the theaters start changing up the way they do some things. I love that idea. And there are some theaters that do that. <clears throat> you know, I, we've, like I said, we've made 25 shorts, short films about this subject matter. And there are some theaters that have actually shown some of our shorts before the, the, the feature film. And, um, that has, that has been happening, but it doesn't happen often enough. Well, what kind of, uh, what kind of reception have you had overall about this film? A good one. <laughs> I think it started with, the, you know, it started with the, the guy in the mosque who said every American needs to see that. And it's just gone from there. You know, we've had a lot of nice reviews. Um, we've got had a ton of, you know, of views of the film. Hundreds of thousands of people have seen the film already. Uh, we've screened it more than 70 times in the last several weeks. And we're going to continue to do so. Uh, we have plans to actually have the film we're working with a group called Facing History and ourselves, and they work with the public schools. So there are 170,000 teachers who participate in the, in the Facing History program, and we're part of their curriculum. So this film will be shown to middle school and high school age children across the country um, to hundreds of thousands of kids. So we're very excited about that. Uh, we think that's where partly where change can happen. So the reception has been great. And, you know, recently we, you know, we're one of our executive producers is Malala Yousafzai. Uh, you know, I don't know if you know, remember her, she's, you know, she's an icon and, uh, you know, she was the victim of a shooting, uh, in Pakistan and she, um, has become a hero. And she stands by this film and is spreading the word about it. And she's our executive producer. And uh, to be aligned with her and to have that force behind this film and what she stands for behind this film is so, so meaningful to us. And we believe it's going to really help us reach, reach even more people. You know, one of the uh, people that uh, really surprised me in the documentary was Richard McKinney's ex-wife was it difficult to get her to appear in the documentary and 
I will, I want to ask this because of the fact that towards the end of the documentary, when it was revealed that they were no longer married, um, did it have something to do with that situation as to why they were not married anymore? Yeah. So Dana McKinney is, is Richard's ex-wife. She is um, a lovely person. And we spoke a lot before we made, went, came and made the film. She and I talked a lot on the phone. I really got to know her. And, you know, that's part of the documentary filmmaker's journey is you have to, you have to get to know your subjects and, and, and you have to win their trust and show them that your intentions are good. And, you know, we spent a lot of time talking and she was willing to share her part of the story because she understood how important this film could be. And, you know, while it was a very painful story and chapter in her life, because, you know, imagine you're married to someone and you're in love with them and you find out they want to commit mass murder. <laughs> you know, how do you navigate that? And that's the situation she was in. So um, she spoke very candidly about it and uh, was very generous about it. But, you know, that takes a toll on a relationship. Uh, and, um, you know, I think it was hard to recover from that. So she um, and Richard got divorced and, uh, and she was still willing to share the story uh, with us. And I know she wishes the best for him. And I know he wishes the best for her. And the daughter was also in the documentary and which I thought was, I think her story was also very interesting because of the fact that here she is, she sees her father as a former military, um, sees the anger, um, sees the rage. And then over time and in a very short amount of time, see him change into a better man. And so what kind of conversations did you have with her? Well, Emily McKinney was eight years old when this all happened. And, you know, she is, I think she's one of the heroes of the film. She's someone who, you know, she, she loved her father and her father loved her. And, you know, this is, we're talking about a guy who was planning to commit mass murder, but he loved his, he loved his daughter. And, you know, that really humanized him. That made him, I think in, in the film, it's very important that we understand that he has the capacity to love as well as to hate, you know, and that's, that was his salvation in my opinion. And so when, when he erupted one day at his daughter, because she had, she had been hanging around with a Muslim boy, you know, and when Mac found out about this, he was enraged and he showed her that rage. She looked at him and said like, what's wrong with you? You know, like, you, you know, why are you acting this way? And he questioned himself. And, and that's when he decided to go to the mosque to do a little reconnaissance because he realized he had a moment of doubt, I believe, about his plan. And he needed to find out more. And frankly, that move, that, that conversation and that what Emily, this eight-year-old girl, did for him in that moment was change the course of everything because because he went to the mosque and because he met those people for Emily, he did it for her, no one died. Lives were saved. And it was a beautiful act by her. And that's why I see her as, as a hero in the story. She is definitely a hero. Now, have you received any feedback from former military uh, personnel that have watched the film, who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and have seen the things that they have done firsthand and then come home and uh, is this film changed their minds? I've talked with some military folks who, who have seen this story and are very supportive of it, uh, you know, and see the importance in it. Um, I'd like to speak with more of them, and I, I'm hoping that as we roll this film out, that we'll be able to do screenings with veterans and also, you know, with active members, with with recruits. I feel like seeing this story and understanding the toll of combat is something that would be good for people to understand before they enter, uh, as well as after. You know, I think there's a lot to be learned here 
about um, how to navigate the challenges of, of, of war and of, of um, military service. Well, you have created one very powerful documentary. And where can all of my viewers watch the documentary, Stranger at the Gate? Sure. It's actually available for free, no paywall, uh, on thenewyorker.com, as well as on YouTube on the New Yorker channel. And uh, that is by design. You know, we want as many people to see this film as possible. And so we, we made it free uh, because it's, it's too important not to have it be able to be shared with as many people as possible. And I encourage people to, you know, not only to watch it, but because it's free and it's on YouTube to share it with people they love and people that might, you know, benefit from seeing this film. Uh, I think... I think you will be, um, it's a wild ride, this film, and I, I, I hope people um, take, take something from it. Well, it is well-deserved to receive an Academy Award nomination for this film. So what is next for Joshua Seftel? Well, uh, we're working on the next one. We're, we're doing a, another documentary about a hate crime victim, a 9-11 hate crime victim. Uh, it's actually, believe it or not, a very inspiring story. Uh, as well. And, um, and there's also been conversation about turning this film, Stranger at the Gate, into a, uh, a feature, a narrative feature, you know, a scripted movie with actors. And, and uh, that is in the works as well. Uh, we're excited about that because it's a, another way to bring this story to an even bigger audience. There's been a lot of, a lot of interest and we're, we have some momentum there too. So, that's, that's also very exciting for us. Keep up the work, Joshua. Um, I, I'm impressed beyond, uh, I mean, I'm in awe of this <laughs> film, Stranger at the Gate. And ladies and gentlemen, you need to head over to thenewyorker.com. It's on the site. That's where I watched the film. Uh, they also have their own YouTube channel. Pass this film around, Stranger at the Gate, nominated for an Oscar this year. It is one of the most powerful 23 minutes you will ever watch because look, we see the narratives across the news channels day in, day out in racism. But you know what? It only happens when we listen to the other side, when we listen to things that we don't understand. And what have I always said on the show? Be willing to learn. Be willing to gain knowledge. Be willing to to gain understanding. And it only starts with one thing, listening. That's all we have to do is listen. And when you see Stranger at the Gate, you'll see the most powerful force move. And it's called love. Love conquers hate, always will. And we can always stand upon that truth to know that love will always conquer hate. Joshua Seftel, I wanna thank you so much for coming onto the program today. Thank you, Ward. It's, it's really an honor. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as Joshua Seftel, please check out Stranger at the Gate at thenewyorker.com. Again, nominated for an Academy Award. And as for me, stay tuned. I'll be right back with more. When I first saw him, I remember saying, there's something not right with this guy. It was a little scary. He seemed to be like a redneck. He was walking kind of fast, his head was kind of down, pacing back and forth. I was hoping for at least 200 or more dead, injured. You know, he thought he was doing the right thing. He was at war with Muslims in his mind. When I tell people this story, they tell me that they don't believe me. My dad calls my mom the Mother Teresa of the Muslim community, and it's definitely true. I invited him over for dinner. I couldn't help it except to make him feel from my heart that he is welcome. I could never in a million years repay this community what they've given me.